Hey you folks, Quilly Dean here and welcome to another episode of Let's Make a Simple Scoreboard in Unity. Now there's a bit of a wonkiness I'm going to admit here in that um, I, uh, I actually had a bit of a crash. I started recording the second episode and it crashed. It actually ate my scene and everything. It was a really bizarre Unity crash that I haven't seen before. So I had to recreate things and uh, I actually made things a scooch prettier, but hardly so. Um, I'm going to admit, I guess I can even make the header maybe, uh, let's make it bold. Maybe a bigger font, 20, and then, oh, I should, this text thing, just make it as wide as it needs to be to be visible, and then take this header and move it down a bit, and, oh, if I recall correctly, we actually ended the last episode with making an empty for the, the player score list, I think, like that, and I think what we had it at was stretched and sitting around there. Okay, so this area down here needs to be populated and the idea is to populate it with the individual player scores so what i'm going to do i made this uh, little header block actually just to make it a little spiff here i'm just going to copy i mean duplicate this and bring it down into the player score list so this is going to be a player score entry instead of a header and um, i'm going to go ahead and just bump it down a little bit like that and then I'll go and fit in some of these numbers. Where we've got numbers here, the kills, death, and assists, I'm just going to put in some numeric values in there so that we can see how it goes. Now, does it screw up the lineup? It does. I need to make sure that the sizes stay consistent. So what I've used in my header, I used a, a vertical or horizontal layout group, which I think is quite spiffy. But I think what would be a good idea is if we put a layout element on each one of these child things and tell it, that we have a, um, that its width is zero flexible. And then if we take the same thing, duplicate it, put it inside of the player score list. And again, take these bad boys and put in some numbers and start changing it. And they still move. I don't want them to have a flexible width. I mean, I guess I could tell them to have a, uh, a preferred width of like a hundred characters or yeah, like that. And then take this and then if we Ah, uh, that's better. That's what I want. Uh, so we're going to name this. This is going to be player score entry. And again, I'm going to move this down. And I'll do the same thing in the headers. I'll tell these guys here that they have a width of, uh, they want to be 100 pixels wide. That way everything will always line up very, very nicely. Um, there we have it. And actually in the header, maybe I'll center. Hmm... Yeah, that's fine. Let's not mess around with it too much. I'll, I'll leave the prettifying to you guys. So we have this line item that we're going to have. I think I'm going to make the graphic a little bit uh, translucent. There we go. So the idea is that underneath this header, we're going to have all the actual entries, which is this thing. So I'm going to make this into a prefab, and then I'm going to make a bunch of duplicates. Now, I don't want to place these. What I want to do in the player score list is I want to add a component for a vertical layout group. And then it'll automatically place all these items within it. Now, the one catch is it automatically resizes them vertically to all fit in the list, which is not what I want. Um, I want to have like an assigned size. So on the player score entry, I'm going to go ahead and add another uh, layout element. I'm going to say that I've got a preferred height and I think I'm basing it around 35 pixels. So a preferred height. And then if I apply that, oh, and do not force the child to expand. There we go. And now if I change this, to say 25, apply. I'm missing something. This should definitely not still be expanding. I mean, I could turn off the flexible height, but I don't think I should have to. Eh, maybe I do. Back to 35. Yeah, that's better. Okay. And if I duplicate all this, there we go. So we can have multiple entries. They'll always be approximately the same height and they'll be under there. So now the idea is this. We're going to make sure that we have one of these entries for every single player that we currently have in our scoring system. So to go ahead and make sure we've got a bit more dummy data, I'm going to reopen the score manager over here. There we go. And big in all this. And we're going to set some more data in here. Uh, so we've got deaths and assists for Quill. So I've only died 10 times because, or 12 times because I'm super good. I've assisted, uh, 345 times. Then we'll have Bob in here who's got two kills and Bob has, uh, deaths of, um, whoops, 
14,345, and he's going to have no assists, which will automatically default to zero in there. And actually, I'll go ahead and put in a couple more dummy entries. We're going to have AAAAA, and we'll just have them default to zero or something like that. I just want them to be in list. B, 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 and C, 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 like so. All right. So here's the idea. When we run, um, so these player score entries, I'm going to make sure we've applied all the changes. I'm going to remove them. What I'm going to do is on player score list, I'm going to make um, a script on this. I'm going to make a player score list function. Its job will be to query our score manager, find out the score, find out what players are in here, and then spawn and organize the list appropriately. So what I'm gonna need, first of all, I'm gonna need a public game object, which is going to be our player score entry prefab. And just as a test, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in for int equals zero, int is, or i equals zero, i is less than five, and i plus plus. We're going to do this. We're going to instantiate the player score entry prefab. Oops, copy the right thing. The player score entry prefab. I don't give it to, need to give it a position or a rotation. And the reason is its position is going to be handled entirely by our vertical layout manager. I do have to grab a copy of it like so. And the reason I need to do that is because I actually have to tell this that it's a child of me. And to do that, it used to be you would take this game object's transform and set its parent to be equal to say this transform. And that still works, but if we run this, we'll get a whole bunch of ugly errors. Let's go ahead and hit play. Actually, we'll get a bunch of terrible errors because I never assigned the prefab over here. So let's go ahead and assign the prefab. If I hit play, it'll work in the list, but I'll get warnings. And the reason is in the new system, they highly encourage you to, instead of setting parent directly, is use the set parent function. And the reason is set parent, this is exactly the same as what we had before. Set parent has an optional second parameter, which you can tell it whether you want it to stay in the world position or not. It makes zero difference in this particular situation because uh, the position is gonna be reset by our vertical layout manager. But basically if you set it to true, then the object will stay exactly where it was before. And if you set it to false, then its location is gonna be used as its local position instead so it'll be reoriented relative to its parent completely moot right over here so um this will well we had it working except with warnings if we hit play it will create five copies of our player score entry and it will parent those things to me at which point it'll automatically re reflowed and fit in perfectly fine that's pretty good now of course we don't want to just generate x number of entries what we want to do is we want to get from the score manager, hey, um, how many players do you have in your database? Or, I mean, at the very least, we have to query something to get a player list. And right now, the only way we really have to get a player list is from our score manager. So why don't we add a little helper function in our score manager? That's something like public string, an array of strings, um, get player names. So its job is to simply return an array of player names which is pretty straightforward. We have, of course, our, um, our, our dictionary called player scores, and the keys in the dictionary are simply the player names. Now, I can't return this as is because keys is not technically an array of strings. It's a, it'll tell me on the mouse up, it's a key collection. Now, you can convert a key collection to an array of strings very, very easily. The easiest way of doing it is very nice. We're going to add another um, another inclusion over here. We're going to say using system.link. This is a fantastic little library that helps you do all sorts of work with uh, collections and records and stuff like that. Uh, definitely recommend checking out the documentation on this. It does beautiful, beautiful things. Um, we're going to use it for two functions in this particular tutorial. The first, we're going to use it to convert this collection of keys to an array. So this will actually become an array of strings. And so now get player names returns an array of strings. So over here, we can do something like string names equals, well, how do we get the score manager? Well, here's what we wanna do. We 
need to, first of all, it would be a great idea. We're going to have to refer to this a few times. So let's make a, um, a member variable here for score manager to hold on to it. And then we'll go and grab a copy of it. So score manager, we can get the score manager, so on. Because score manager is a component on one of our game objects, we can use game object dot find object of type game, uh, sorry, score manager. Now note, if you have more than one instance of score manager, if you have more than one object with a component of score manager, uh, it's you're not necessarily going to know which one you're going to grab. You definitely don't want to have more than one score manager in your game. That would lead to weirdness in all kinds of different ways. Technically, you can use a singleton design pattern for this. It's a little bit beyond the scope of this tutorial. So we're going to do this. So this is going to find our score manager that's in the game, and it's going to stuff it inside a score manager. We could put in a check here. If score manager is equal to null, then we could say something like um, debug.log error you forgot to add the score manager component to a game object and then we will simply return and quit out earlier but for now we can go something like get player names so we have this array and then we can do something like instead of this for loop like this we can say for each string name in names we can loop through this and then we can actually take it an extra step um, when we create our entry our player score entry we've got this field called username we could set the text of this field to the player's name, which sounds like a pretty good idea. So how do we do that? Well, um, our game object, this game object here, is this player score entry. So it has a child called username. So what I can say is something like go.transform.find, and this will find a child inside of this object with this object name, which in this case will be username. Now, um, I'm going to just assume that this exists. I'm not going to do any error checking. If for some reason you haven't spelled username the exact same way, no spaces, capital U, just make sure these match up entirely, or otherwise you'll get an, an error letting you, you know, it's not going to be able to find this for the next step. So we're going to get a component dot user, or we're going to get an object called username, and then we want to access the text component on it. This is a class called text. However, you can't use it immediately. The reason is finally, and it only took 4.6 versions of Unity, they have moved, or they, they haven't moved anything, but this new UI system exists in its own namespace, which is beautiful and wonderful and a great idea. But it means that to use it, you're going to have to pull in the unity.ui namespace. And then what we can do is go .get component text. The reason, because it's in its own namespace, you get to use great simple class names like text. And it has a, uh, a, a method on it, a method, a variable, whatever you want to call it, text, uh, a member variable, I guess. And we can set it to whatever we want, in which case we'll set it to the name. So now let's see what happens if we hit play. We get an error. Object reference not sent to an instance of the object. Oh, our player names get keys is trying to access player scores before it exists. So we actually need to initialize here. Oh, and that's actually going to reveal another issue. Let's hit play. We will no longer get an error, but absolutely nothing happens here. Have you guys figured out why? The reason is, as I said, we've got this happening in start and we've got this happening in start. Well, what's happening is this start is executing first. So it's grabbing the current list of players. Well, right now, there are no players. There are no players until this start runs, at which point it's too late. The UI has already done its thing. So what we want to do, all this code over here, we actually don't want it to run inside of start. We want it to run inside of update. So we're going to take, okay, we're, this first line here, this line is slow. Anytime you do a fine object of type, it's very slow. So we only want to do it once inside the start. That's reasonable. And then everything else, we'll go ahead and stick it inside of update. So this will run every single frame. This will also be a bit slow because we're creating a bunch of objects. In fact, hold on, we don't want to create um, one, two, three, four, five. We don't want to create five objects every frame. We'll overload our, our system within seconds. We'll have thousands and thousands of objects. So before we go and create all of these child objects let's go and remove any we already have we'll refresh the list completely this is going to be important because players might quit join 
um, change their name, that sort of thing. So we'll remove anything we already had and then we'll refresh the list. Again, this will be very slow, but it's okay. We'll optimize it shortly. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set while this.transform.childCount is greater than zero. While we have children, we are going to get our first child. So this.transform.getChild with index of zero. We're going to, what we ultimately want to do is destroy this child. However, this loop will be an infinite loop right now. The reason is destruction only kind of happens at the end of a frame or between frames. So we will we'll mark this child for destruction. It's basically what will happen. Then we'll come here and the child will still be considered part of us. We'll still have, you know, X number of children. So no matter how often we loop here, we'll still have children. So what we have to do, in addition to marking it for destruction, we have to remove it from our hierarchy. We have to remove this child from our list of children. And the best way to do that is, or the way to do that, is to tell this child that it no longer has a parent. So this child will no longer have a parent and then we'll flag it for destruction. And then when we loop here, we'll have one fewer child and then we'll loop through and clear the whole list. Again, this will be slow, but we'll optimize it a little bit soon. Now, if we hit play, hey, we get a list of stuff and it's a bit derply. Clearly I didn't do a very proper job with my, um, with my layouts here. Let's not worry about it. We can make it pretty some other time. I, I don't like that it's not lined up, but uh, yeah, we'll just have to move on. Anyway, all right, so we clear out the list and then we refresh it. And technically this is running every single frame. And again, it is not fast. If I go pop open the stats uh, and then I have to make sure that I turn off VSync. So this will let this program run as fast as it can. Let's see how many frames per second we're getting. I'm getting 60, 70, 80, 80-ish 80 frames per second right now. That is insanely slow for something that's just doing this. And I'll show you exactly. If I go into this update, if I just quit out of this update early by hitting a return over here, so none of the rest of the stuff will run, and I hit play, let's see how much faster it runs. Oops, hit play again. We're now running at hundreds, no, thousands of frames per second, around 6,000 frames per second. Um, that's a pretty big difference. So that highlights how slow this code is. It's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll fix things later. So not only are we uh, setting the username, but hey, why don't we go ahead and set its kills, deaths, assists. How do we get that data? Well, we have our score manager and we can say get score for the username, which is name, and then get kills. Notice. I've got a capital K here, but a lowercase K here because that's the way I ended up doing things. You have to make sure that all your spelling is exactly correct based on what you've done everywhere else. Otherwise it won't work. So you have to have a certain amount of internal consistency. But if we do this and we hit play, I can hide these stats. Oh, cannot implicitly convert int to a string. Score manager dot get string or get score returns an integer where text wants a string. So we have to just convert the integer to a string, which we can do with a two string over here. Two string also lets you do additional formatting. You can put in commas and decimal points and all kinds of niceties like that, which we don't need right now. There we go. So we can see our scores are being put in there. And again, everything is not aligned properly because I did a terrible job setting up the UI, but the numbers are there. The horrible performance is still there though. That is just terrible, miserable, miserable stuff that shouldn't exist. So why is it so slow? The reason it's so slow is because destroying and creating objects is a slow operation. And right now we're doing it every single frame. Now it's kind of important because, let me show you something neat. In our score manager, let's make some sort of dummy function. Let's make a public void debug add kill to quill. So this is a, a placeholder function. Its entire job is to uh, change score quill 18 kills and then one. Oops. It's just a function that we're going to use to test something out. We're going to make a really quick button over here in our canvas. Actually, we'll put it as part of our panel. Maybe if Unity responds to me, please, thank you. Um, we're going to make a UI button. I take it, I'm going to stick it right down here. I'm going to change the text to say 
debug add kill. And so a button in Unity uh, can have a list of listeners over here that will listen to on-click events. So we're going to add a new one. We're going to say the our scripts object is going to be the object we send a message to. And specifically, we're telling score manager debug add kill to quill. So now if I hit play and I click the button, the number of kills I have goes up. Now, obviously, we don't want that kind of button in the real game. But this here, or more appropriately almost, if we go into our start over here, is whenever an event happens, let's say quill dies so right now hang on uh, let's set uh, we're going to say quill has zero deaths to start off with but over here there's some event that happens that will kill quill so here we're going to say change score quill 18 deaths one whenever someone dies in the game you're going to basically run this sort of thing to register it and the nice thing about it is your scoreboard will automatically display that. If we look at... Oh, oh, oh. Because I'm setting the score here, which is overriding some things. There we go. So now Kill's got, or Quill's got his death. So you're going to use these sorts of events to just let the score manager know when those numbers change. Right now we've got a button because we don't actually have a game in here. So that's good. So here what's the deal here our score list right now we are regenerating this list every single frame you could do some things where you check to see if something already exists and only remove it if not and uh, listen that we're not gonna we're not gonna do that that'll be um more complicated than we need to be and honestly not necessarily the best solution what we really want is we only want to regenerate this list when the score manager has had some sort of change to it so here's what we can do in the score manager, we can have int something like um, change counter, which can start at zero. Every time there's a change, anytime a score is set, well, actually, literally, anytime a score is set, we just increment the change counter by one, just goes up by one. That's it. Now, our player score list can track something like int last change counter. And in the start, what we're going to do is we're going to set our change counter to the score manager's current change counter, which, oh, we can't get. It's not a public. So we're going to need a public int get change counter, which simply returns change counter. Uh, is that what I called it? That is what I called it. Dot get change counter and then in our update it's very simple if score manager dot get change counter is equal to our last change counter then no change since last update we just exit otherwise what we do is we update our get change counter our last change counter and we actually do the update now we only do all this heavy lifting when something's actually changed so now let me turn the stats back on and hit play huge frame rate and then i add kills and then every time i add kills there's a little bit of processing time to regenerate this list but it's really short and really the kills aren't going to add up that quickly in a moba and fps or whatever there's different ways of optimizing it but you know what that's going to be pretty darn good now we're getting there. We're getting very close. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn the VSync back on just so that my computer doesn't melt down. Now, one thing that is not obvious right now is our list is not sorted properly. You're going to say, well, I don't know. It looks okay to me. Let me show you. Let's say Quill has zero kills. Bob has 1,000. And BBB over here has um, 500. Now let's hit play. That doesn't look like the right order anymore. In most of these games, it's sorted based on who has the most kills. So Bob should be at the top, BBB should be second, then, you know, whoever else is in whatever order they're in. Um, as it happens, they happen to be in the order they were added to the database. You can't actually count on that. It's, it's not something you can guarantee. So here's the thing. 
how do we get this list to be ordered based on kills? Well, here's what I think the best way is. Our get player names right now just returns player names. What if we have another version of it that lets us do something like score or sorting score type? What if we can pass it some score type we want to sort by? That sounds pretty good. And then over here in our player score list, when we get our list of player names, let's sort it based on the number of kills. Cool. So how do we return the list of player names sorted by how many people they killed? Well, we've already gone and included this link library. And it is very powerful for database manipulation. And what it allows you to do is something like this. I'm going to do it and then I'm going to explain it. So we're going to return. Actually, let me do it as a, as a multi-step process here. We're going to do uh, an array of strings called names. And it's going to be exactly the same as what we had before. Right, this, this is just our names. But now we want to sort these and return that. So instead of returning just names, which is what's happening over here, we're gonna return names dot order by. Order by exists in this list because we included the link directive and it allows you to do things like sort arrays. So we're gonna sort this array based on something. We have to pass it a kind of a function here. So this is gonna run kind of a mini function. It's going to put the name it's currently looking at, and it wants to know what to sort by. Um, and so we want to sort by using the name as an entry. We want to sort based on the score of that name and the sorting score type. So this is going to return, in our example, the first loop through it's going to find, I don't know, quill 18. And let's say we sort the sorting skill type to kills. So it's going to say, n is going to be quill 18. It's going to go get score, quill 18, kills. Then it's going to pass it Bob, get score, Bob kills. Then it's going to pass it AAAA. And so it's going to internally convert the list of names into their list of values we want to sort by. It's going to sort by those values. And now it's going to return the names based on that score. Now it's not actually going to work exactly how you might imagine quite yet. Oh, and there's an issue. This, just like before with the keys, doesn't technically return an array. We have to do the two array. And actually, we could save a few steps. First of all, we could save a variable and also this extra array conversion. We can actually just chop this like this and like that. I know it's a pretty hairy line, but we're taking the player scores, their keys. Those keys are going to be sorted based on their score that we're passing in here. The whole thing gets converted to an array. And then if I hit play, cross your fingers, bam, it's in the wrong order. The reason is order by... Think about a list of numbers. The correct order for a list of numbers would be one, two, three, four, five. But we want a high scores list here. We want the scores where the highest number comes first. Five, four, three, two, one, which is why we want to use order by descending. Hit play. Hey, look at that. Our scores list is sorted based on how many kills the person has. Again, the formatting is just awful and miserable, but there you have it. Um, I felt like there was one thing more I wanted to do, but now I can't remember what that might be. It might be done. Actually, uh, another cool thing we can do is if we were to go and set BBB to have, say, let's do this, three, two, one kills. Hit play. So you can see Quill is at the bottom here. If I hit add kills, Quill will make his way up the list in real time. Not bad. Oh, that's the thing I want to do, uh, a way to toggle the scoreboard, because right now it's up all the time. So in uh, how do we want to do this? The easiest way to toggle a scoreboard is to take the panel. This should be the scoreboard panel. We want to take this and you simply make it inactive or active based on whether it's supposed to show up. The nice thing is when it's inactive, you get a further optimization in that anything that's inactive, the update routine does not run on anything that's inactive. So you actually save a little bit of extra CPU power there. Even if the, the scores change, we won't be refreshing our list except when the, the view is visible. So that's pretty good. So what do we wanna do? I'd say on our canvas, actually anywhere, literally anywhere, it doesn't matter where we put it. I will probably put it on my canvas. I'm gonna create a function called window manager. Its job will simply be to open and close windows as appropriate. So we're gonna open that up now. What we're going to do, basically in the update, we're going to do something like if input dot get uh, key down 
And uh, classically, a lot of games use the tab key to toggle the scoreboard. So we're going to do the same thing here. When you tab, it'll toggle the scoreboard. So how will it work? We obviously need a reference to the scoreboard. We need, you know, scoreboard dot, and then we're going to do something. Well, we need this. How are we going to do it? Well, um, we can grab it and start. We could do something like game object dot find scoreboard panel. A couple issues with that, and then we could stuff it in something, right? You know, equals this, like that. A couple issues with that. One, you have to make sure that you've got everything spelled correctly and never change your spelling anywhere, which is a pain in the butt. Also, gameobject.find doesn't work on anything that's inactive. If I toggle that off, this can now not be found using gameobject.find, which that's not good, obviously. So what instead we're going to use is we're going to use a public reference. Now, I can use public game object scoreboard like this. I don't like to do a game object here. The reason is when it's a game object, you can actually slide a prefab into that slot um, from from just your, your project list, which is obviously not what's intended here. So I like to force the issue and say it has to be a transform because, and we'll remove that line, obviously. And let me just comment this out. Because if you have it as a transform, you can't drag something from the pro. Actually, apparently you can. Seriously? This whole time, I thought you wouldn't be able to drag something in there if you specified that you wanted to transform. Is there no way to force it to not be something in the project? Because I only want it to be something that's actually instantiated. Huh. All right, then. It's a moot point. Tell you what, then. I'll just make it a game object and we'll suck it up. But yeah, it's important that it's not a prefab. So uh, let's just make sure we've got... There we go. Scoreboard panel has been dragged in there. And now we can toggle it. So the idea is when the tab key is down, we want to call, um, is it set? It's active. It's set active. Yeah. We want to set active. And we want to set the active to the opposite of whatever it currently is, which we can get. Scoreboard dot uh, active self. That's what it currently is. So if we just put a little not on front of that, we're going to set active to the opposite of what it currently is because it's just a boolean and we can do that so this should let us toggle things if we hit play there you go tab in and out show hide show hide so there is a very basic scoreboard which works looks terrible you should graphic it up you should you know organize your your ui there um maybe you know we'll, we'll try to there, there's plenty of really good tutorials out there to show you how all these um, vertical layout groups, horizontal layout groups, layout elements, how they work. I may try to do my own at some point, although I, I, right now I feel like it might be a little bit redundant. And, and the documentation is also very good for it. So if you're lost about how to make things pretty, just go and read that stuff. But it is functional and you can use this in your game. The other thing I'll note is that if the list got too big, um, the list of player score entries, which I guess I can force the issue this way, um, it doesn't scroll, it sort of shrinks. You might want scroll bars and things. Uh, and for that, you'll want to look into how scroll recs work and that sort of thing. But uh, for now, that is the end of this tutorial. I hope you appreciate it, or I hope you enjoyed it. See you guys next time. Bye-bye.